All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Wine, Women, and Words. I am Michelle, and with me, of course, is Diana. Hello. And this is our February book of the month. Now, of course, if this is your first time on a book of the month episode, uh, all the spoilers, we will be talking about everything. And if you have not finished our February February book, which is The Many Daughters of Afanwai, please save this episode and come back later because we don't want to spoil anything for you. Now, that being said, you have been warned and you are will be listening at your own risk from this point forward. And we have author Jamie Ford with us to uh, let, let him uh, or let us pick his brain for the evening. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And and a good good uh, spoiler alert. Um, I remember on my very first book tour uh, for Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, I was in Spokane and this woman during the Q&A in the body of her question gave away the entire ending of the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, I think the, the book club ladies around her, I thought we're just going to rise up and just beat her with hardbacks. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Did you like try to like play that off or was there no coming back from it? I, there was no coming back from it. I was I was stunned. I was like, oh, sorry about that, folks. And <laughs> we'll answer this question as delicately as we can. And everyone can just pretend they didn't hear it, but they did. Oh, no. It happens. Yeah, it happens. It does. It does. I think there's uh, I'm glad that we switched to a format where we could do the edit things because I accidentally once gave out a spoiler for the book and it wasn't the the big spoiler but it was a spoiler and I said it and I was like oh crap like I realized <laughs> what I did right after I did it so we had as when we were like okay we're putting spoilers in everything everything that we have if we have to with the podcast good call yeah so, so far, we haven't had any complaints. Yet. No. And you can always tell, like, if it's on it, like, it does, you know, every now and then something slips out, and you can tell by by expressions, like, oh, <laughs> 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 something was said that should not have been said. <laughs> but for our book of the month episodes, we, as you know, we make the, the spoiler uh, alert, and everything else is fair game. I mm -hmm. like it. They've been warned. Yes, yes exactly. Yes. So I don't even know where we just, we absolutely love this book. Mm -hmm. This was a book that many, many text messages were sent. And uh, one, I was very frustrated with uh, a certain son and his mother mm -hmm. uh, in a certain scene. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even give Diana any warning. I just like a warning text message like I'm reading I'm at this part of the book I just went into a rant about the characters assuming she would know what I was talking about but that's just we we just love this book thank and you for yeah, writing it was it. pre coffee <laughs> and I had just woken up and I'm like wait a minute who are these people what's this drama <laughs> And then I was like, oh, wait, <laughs> now I know we're just like, I, I don't even know a Lewis. What happened? <laughs> <laughs> it takes me a few minutes to catch up when it comes to coffee. Well, I think I know where we begin. I think we could start with the epigenetics oh, sure, uh, sure. portion of it. Um, <clears throat> Ask away. So me, reading this book, it hit, I think, a little differently than others in some ways, because I'm actually in the process of adoption. Oh, and man. we're going through the foster care system. So in reading this, I think they they tell you all sorts of different books that you need to read. Um, and I feel like this was the one I feel like that prepared me the most for adopting a kid through foster care because they tell you you're going to get a kid that's got um, a backstory. And, you know, even as an author, I'm like, okay, all right, there's a backstory. But then in reading this it was just like hit home that it's not just a backstory you've got this genetic memory that can carry through in generations and the epigenetic research that sh that was in the book is so fascinating and I just kind of want to talk about that for a minute how, how, uh, how long have you been a foster parent um we're applying right now we had our first home study the, uh this morning so I did the whole clean the house from top to bottom, 
before it was the first time a social worker even stepped in her house. I even pulled, I even baked cookies. I did a Monica <laughs> from, <laughs> I had pulled out cookies just before she came in. I'm like waving, making sure you have a fresh cookie scent in the house before she came in. Fun. I'm glad you're doing that. I I, I was uh, a foster parent in the past, and um, just the foster parent training alone is like a it's an emotional journey. Um, I mean, it's really intense, um, but it's so worth doing. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, epigenetics. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm yeah, happy. and it's interesting that awesome. foster parent and epigenetic uh, aspect comes into play with it for you as well. Yeah, I think. I I mean, that's probably the struggle for, for anyone who's adopted, um, not just uh, epigenetics, but just regular, you know, uh, health things, finding, you know, a, a, a bone marrow donor when you don't know your birth parents and things like that. Um, it it pre presents itself with um, some, an extra set of, of challenges and considerations. Mm -hmm. uh, I was, I was really fascinated about uh, epigenetics because, I mean, there's those moments when growing up where you're just like, you pause and you sort of reflect and you're like, oh God, I'm my mother or my father. Um, but as you become a parent, you know, with my own kids, I would see my children behave in a way that was so similar to my dad or my grandparents. Um, that it just, it, epigenetics isn't a hard sell. I think most, most people have some sort of anecdotal um support for it um and certainly in like native american communities uh the idea of inherited trauma is just you know it's been accepted since the beginning um but yeah there's just some amazing studies of the descendants of holocaust survivors the descendants of civil war prisoners um there was a study of children who <clears throat> uh, who were in utero when their mom uh, watch the Twin Towers come down on 9-11, and now those kids are in their early 20s, and they're studying their health outcomes compared to the average. Um, I think, you know, we're, I do think we are, you know, it's that debate, the, the, you know, we're a mix of nature versus nurture, but I think there's more nature than we want to admit, because it would, it would remove, you know, an aspect of free will, and no one wants to think that, you know, we're not the captains of our own ship. Um, but it was something that I've, you know, I, I was, th there was a study done in 2013, um, at Emory university where they showed how, you know, a, a single traumatic event had been passed through like three or four generations of lab animals. And so finally there's been some like clinical, um, evidence. And, and again, it's, I'm sure it's still hotly debated, um, but it's certainly fascinating. So well worth writing about. And what was, um, which came first as far as uh, building the story, the idea of, and of course, um, Afang Moy was a person who existed and um, and lived a life. Um, was your, your interest in exploring her story came, did that come first or the idea of exploring epigenetics through um, through generations of, of a particular family come first. Yeah, the, the epigenetics came later. Um, you know, I, I had known about Afong since since the 90s. Um, and I, I had thought about it. I'd like to write about her, but she doesn't um, she doesn't really have a voice in her own life. You know, she she was super famous, but had zero agency. And if I was going to write something that's purely historical fiction, I just, I couldn't find a, a beat of redemption in her story. Um, so I was, I was looking at that. I was, I was doing a lot of research on the Summerhill school in England, which I was fascinated with. Um, did a bunch of research on the plague epidemic in San Francisco in the late 1800s. And then I was at this uh, artist residency in, uh, it's called Ragdale. It's North of Chicago. I was there for a month and that's when it all sort of came together. And I realized if I had this epigenetic thread, I could tie all of these things that I was interested in into one narrative. And also by giving Afang Moy fictional descendants, I could I could give her a voice through, through those descendants and I could redeem her story a little bit. Um, and that's where it, it really all 
came together. But then once I decided that, then I had to do tons more research on uh, epigenetics, um, also uh, optogenetics, which is another uh, thing that was uh, developed in MIT a year later, and you know, totally different uh, areas of science. But the optogenetic experiment showed um, some scientists they transferred a memory from one lab animal to another. And I'm happy to talk about how they, they did that. But I combined those two technologies in Seattle in 2045 as this uh, therapeutic modality for re-remembering the past. Um, I wish I could do that with my own therapist. I wish we could just be like, we're going to re-remember this trauma and give it a you know rainbow at the end. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll, we'll figure it out in the future. It, that was so, I, um, at the end, because I mean, we're doing spoilers at the end when that was happening and she was going through and then, ta then, then I think it was in the, um, uh, at the end and the acknowledgements when you're talking about that, that was just like, so that feels like both an, it could be a positive thing, but also like scary that they can go <laughs> in and change our memories. And it's like, they can it's 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 a very catch-22 when it comes to our science yeah i mean there's a whole you can go down this deep rabbit hole of quantum physics where you know there is one you know uh avenue of theory that if you that the past is malleable that if you remember it differently you've actually changed your past um, of course, you know, you have to sort of live in a uh, string theory multiverse universe and we're going to get I'm going to get way over my skis when it comes to physics. Um, but, yeah, there's just been some fascinating experiments. Not all of them will translate into, you know, a novel. It was hard. It was hard putting this kind of uh, science in a novel and trying to do it in a way that didn't put people to sleep. You know, I don't <laughs> I want it to be interesting and fascinating, but not uh, boring. Um, mm. And a lot of the things that I had to read for research, you know, they're they're not written for entertainment. They're written for uh, peer review. They're super dry academic stuff. But um, hopefully, I you know, hopefully, I put it together in a way that the readers can uh, can consume and appreciate. Well, I think you achieved that just fine. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I absolutely love that the places that um, Zoe and Annabelle, uh, the schools and, and the retreat that they went to, I love that those were real places. And I also cannot believe that I have driven past Rag Ragdale so many times. We, my husband was stationed in Great Lakes in Illinois and we lived there for like three and a half years, almost four years. And I looked it up after I read the acknowledgments and even listening to the book, I was like, oh, North Chicago. I wonder, you know, I wonder where in North Chicago. And then I read the acknowledgments and oh, Lake Forest, that's the next town over from me. And Green Bay Road is like down the street. So that retreat, I've driven past that house. I, I don't remember it specifically, but that street has such beautiful houses and I would just drive down that road going what must it be like <laughs> to, to live a, on on this road it's a very wealthy community for sure and oh, it's beautiful and they you know the owners of that estate donated it to be an artist colony you know probably 80 years ago or something like that um and oop, there's my my dogs <laughs> wandered up so you'll, you will see Lucy pop her head up and be like, hello, I'm here. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I went there and I went intending to write something else. I had started something, you know, I had a, a contract and a deadline and my agent really thought you should maybe just write this because I was, I was struggling and I got there and uh, a writer friend just saw me struggling and she's like, okay, I can tell what you're working on is causing you pain. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> walk away from that and just sorry dogs um, <laughs> and just exist in the space um and you know kind of be inspired and i i was staying in uh the 
it's called the blue room and it's where the founder died in that room and they call it the lucky room which is a little bit of rebranding so it's not the you know the death room or the scary haunted room um but i they call it the lucky room because a lot of really good books have begun in that space <clears throat> most notably uh time traveler's wife uh audrey mm -hmm. niffenegger oh. began her uh her journey with that book in that room um and that's where i began my journey as well oh that's cool i didn't know that but i love the idea of like at you know, there's the writer retreats where you go with all of your author friends and you write during the day. And that's like the dream. Like we've been trying to plan that <laughs> that trip for a very long time. But to do like a like an honest to goodness writer's retreat sounds like amazing. It's I, I didn't understand it. You know, I have a friend, um, the author Hillary Jordan, and she's, you know, she's single. She doesn't have children. So she kind of lives from, goes from retreat to retreat to retreat. And <clears throat> it seems like she spends like half her life at these residencies all over the, all over the world. She's been to one in a Scottish castle and she's been to one in Egypt and one in Brazil. Um, and she was always encouraging me, like, you got to go to these. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a full-time writer. I, you know, I, I work here. I have my space, but um I went and I and I understood. There's no telephone. There's no um, television. You have internet, and they cook all your meals for you. So you just you know wake up, have coffee or whatever, head to your writing space, work all day, and then you see people in the evening, um, and can kind of you know share the journey with fellow travelers, whether they're uh, filmmakers or musicians or um, you know, visual artists and things like that. Um, a lot of, I call it a herd of unicorns because you bring all these really weird, diverse people and then um, who are always kind of the outliers and bring them all together in the space. And it's really, really, really positive. Um, just a really good uh, um, environment to come up with cool ideas or at least, you know, recharge yourself a little bit. Sounds so cool. You know, I kind of feel like I have that because when I'm on deadline, my husband's the one who has to pick up the slack when it comes to the housekeeping, which he may not be happy about it at times. But you know, have you have you applied to them before? To the no, I haven't. I have not. Um, um, you should. But the thought does sound. I should. Yeah. I mean, I saw your face when he said Egypt and Scott and the Scottish castle. I saw the the light oh, oh yes it's I, I love travel um and so does my husband and so there, we've had discussions on if I'm traveling somewhere out, out of the country without him it's this whole thing because he wants to come too even though it, that's not like high up on his list he's going to want to come too for travel sure. we've had this I, just, I, I talked to him about going to a retreat in Sicily once Mm. And he was just like, but I want to go to Sicily too. And we ended well, up you could do like a fishing about, retreat. And then the final saw <laughs> what um Star was, I just I got frustrated. I was like, well then I'll just plan my own vacation. And that just has become a long-term inside joke with us. That sure. we're just gonna plan our own vacation. <laughs> Screw you. Separate vacations. <laughs> Yeah, they're they're really. I, I did one in U. It's called U Cross in Wyoming. Uh, Yado is one of the oldest in the country, and that's in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, BCCA, which is in Virginia, um, was accepted to one in, in Key West, um, and then COVID hit and that mm -hmm. shut that down. But um, yeah, I I can't recommend them highly enough. It's just they're really cool environments. Very cool. Now, one of the things that I want to get into um, in our masterclass portion of the podcast, because really when we have authors on, it's this this podcast isn't for others. It's for us to have our masterclass to talk with other authors. Cool. Um, from, so I'm currently working on a book that has three different perspectives, and that's been a bit of a challenge, to say the least, for me. You've got like, what, there's six perspectives or so? And yours? Yeah, just, seven if you count Annabelle. Oh, true. Seven. Yes, that's right. I, I knew I was off. Um, how? <laughs> it's just, let's just break down the question of basic how and uh, oh my gosh. You know, I 
I really, I think a lot of writers when they, when they're trying to, you know, figure it out, they, you know, they bite off more than they can chew. I, I certainly did. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I think the, I can't, I think it was Brandon Sanderson who had the metaphor of it's like someone sitting down at the piano for the first time and trying to play Rachmaninoff instead of learning the basics. And I think, you know, a lot of people, um, especially when they're really young and ambitious, um, will sit down and, you know, go full Stephen King and try to write, you know, a book with 18 point of view characters, and it's going to be a trilogy and each book's going to be 700 pages. And, and then when they can't do it, they're just like, oh, I guess I'm not a writer. And it it doesn't really work that way. You know, it's a, it's like, like piano, you have to play scales and twinkle, twinkle, little star and work your way up to uh, four Elise by Beethoven. And, you know, you have to practice before you, you have something that anyone wants to listen to, um, let alone, you know, dance to or played at their wedding. I'm going down that metaphoric rabbit hole really far, but um, for me, my first book, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, I purposely wrote it from the point of view of a 12-year-old boy because I figured that'd be, that'd be easier than if I was going to write, you know, a 70-year-old woman or a point of view of a, a ghost or an android or, you know, I, like I'm... I'm somewhat immature <laughs> and I remember those, those young days and it, it was kind of like my training wheels book. And then my, my next book, um, I had two point of view characters. And so I, I just, you know, eventually kicked the training wheels off. <clears throat> and with this book, I just went for it. But during the process, I was never sure if I was going to be able to pull it off. Honestly, I, mm. I was I was afraid I would not stick the landing that it would just be a total mess and there were there were days filled with you know tons of self doubt and uh, frustration, um, but uh, the, the the ironic thing is as I was writing it I was telling myself okay the next book one point of view <laughs> first person it could be super simple and that's kind of what I'm working on just as a a mental palate cleanser. Yeah, I can, I can understand that. This is my third book as well. And I'm just like, have, next book is going to be so much simpler. So uh, much simpler. Yeah. Have you, have you, do you work from an outline? Do you work from a premise or a... Oh, 100% an outline. And oh. I, I think this was the first one. The first two um, I did uh, based on actual women in history, um, Anita Garibaldi and Maria Carolina Charlotte of Naples. And this is the first one where I decided I kicked the training wheels off. And as you said, and it's, I just took one event and I based a whole story around the event. Nice. And so I'm like, did I kick the training wheels off too soon? Why did I do that? that so that, that's been my mental Olympics of being passed, okay, I think I took my my training wheels off a little too soon on this. You you can definitely do it. You can, I mean, if I, if I can do it, anyone can do it. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a, a self-taught writer. I don't, you know, I don't have a degree in anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but it's like, there's a lot of self-taught, there's probably more self-taught musicians working than ones that went to, you know, Berkeley or someplace, uh, College of Music. So, you can figure it out. Um, I have no doubt that that you that you're gonna do it. Um, it's it's just a little bit of a a scary, you know, a scary journey. Um, for me, I normally I, I write in a linear fashion, so mm -hmm. I write start to finish, and I jump back and forth. But with uh, many daughters, I wrote about. 80 pages and I just couldn't do it that way I had to mm -hmm. stop and just roughly write every narrative and then find a way to weave them together and then rewrite them from there mm -hmm. um and I you know I don't know if Stephen King does that like when he wrote The Stand which has a gazillion characters it sure seems like he just flows through it um naturally but you know, he used to do a lot of cocaine and other things. <laughs> maybe, he, maybe he had something augmenting his uh, writing. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll say the cocaine. Um, and I love that you brought up that you're a self-taught author, because I don't think we talk about this enough on the show. Um, 
about the, I think the, the joys and the fact that you don't have to have an MFA to become a published author. Like myself, I'm self-taught as well. And I get all of them. <laughs> yes. Um, and like whenever people ask about like, um, when in an interview, what your advice is, mine has always been to read everything from the back of shampoo bottles to the classics, because that's the best way to learn. Yeah, I have a friend and and she really said, she says, you, you can't teach writing. Like you can, you can sort of put it in front of people, but there's so much they have to figure out. Um, and I, I do think there's, I don't know. I, I have really strong feelings about MFA programs, which is really unfair because I've never been to one. Um, but I see, <laughs> what, I see what they produce. And there's, there's definitely a, a homogenization of, of writing, of how you tell a story. Um, mm -hmm. I, I call it performance writing. It's when you're writing for other writers. You're trying to impress your peers instead of um, tell a cool story. And, you know, and or you're writing for reviewers who are often other writers. Um, and I'm just not really part of that ecosystem. Um, mm -hmm. I've never, I don't know, I've just never, a lot of it is kind of New York focused or Brooklyn focused. And I'm such a West Coast kid. I could care less like what's in the New Yorker. I, it's not, I've never cared. And I, I don't, I plan to start um, because I just don't think everything in New York is better. I think it's just a little older and dirtier. And <laughs> I'm right there with you. I'm originally from New York I'm, and then I moved to the West Coast when I was 17. And I agree the West Coast is far better. The different vibe. Uh, so, I mean, I, and I love Chicago, which is kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the best of, it's not the best mm -hmm. of both worlds, but it's so not New York, you know, mm -hmm. it's a cool city. Yeah, it's it was... definitely its own. Oh, sorry. Was, oh, no, no, okay. Chicago is definitely its own uh, little ecosystem in, in, oh. its, it, in a bubble. And I loved it. I, I loved it when we lived there. Every city um, has a soul. It has its own vibe. And this is like one of the philosophies I have when I go to any city. There's there's a vibe and a, a heartbeat to every city. And New York definitely has this different, definitely this different vibe and heartbeat. And it was really interesting. A few years ago, my husband and I went back to New York, and it was his first time going to New York City. And he's a West Coast boy, born and raised. And then he went to New York City and he was just like, what is this place? I, do, I don't like this. This is so weird. Give me back to California where it's like more open space, having yeah. like the crowded space kind of thing that I think that tripped him out the most. Yeah, I, I love to visit and it's a, <laughs> it, you know, so many cool things to do, but it's like, you know, it's there's just a, for me, there's, there's kind of a literary scene there mm -hmm. that like I, I went to, I was in New York for uh, uh, my first book is being developed into a musical. So I went to a developable performance mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm in town during the Brooklyn book festival. And a friend of mine was, you know, was speaking there and he said, there's an author party, just come crash it. And we'll go together. And so I went and crashed it. And it was right after the, the national book award like you know uh long list was announced and there was just this this catty buzz about the room or uh, who deserves it and who doesn't deserve it and and i'm just not really a part of that world mm -hmm. like i don't i'm not in this like super competitive um zero sum game where if you win i lose and if mm -hmm. and vice versa i i don't see it that way um and New York is, it kind of embodies that, the whole history of the literary community there. Um, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with it. It's its produced brilliant, brilliant books for sure. I just, it's never been my goal to insert myself into that or adopt that. Mm -hmm. I, I live in Montana, for God's sake. You know, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> like I, the funny thing was when my first book had a bunch of success, I would, I would go to the grocery store and people are like, you're still here. Like, they are shocked that they thought I would move to LA or New York. Like Salman Rushdie, you know, rolls up in a minivan and opens the door and is like, get in, we're going to Brooklyn. 
<laughs> it's not. I just want to do my thing and, um, you know, live a somewhat normal life. And it's and it is funny when people kind of look at you differently in one way. Like we had when we had the social worker over this morning. You know, I have got the cookies out in front of her. I was like, can I get you anything? She's like, no, no, I'm fine. And just kind of like brushes all of that off. And then she asks what I do for a living. And I tell her, she's like, oh, I've never met an author before. And she like sits up, right? And I'm like, damn it, maybe I should have led with that. Maybe I should have just offered her a book and, you know, make things even better. <laughs> just yeah. stacks of books next to the cookies. Yes, yes. When when I uh, when I met Leisha, my wife, and we were, <laughs> we were dating, I you know I had I just sold Hotel, and it was a long. No one knew what that book would do, but I remember her telling her friends that she was dating a writer, and they all were like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." <laughs> <laughs> you know a, a bass player in a, <laughs> a wedding band or something like that um but uh when it when it works out it's really a neat thing and um i've just i've just been really lucky my first book had a zeitgeist moment um which i've learned you can't manufacture um so i'm, I'm just grateful for that and um just try to write for myself, which is harder to do with each book because there's this expectation. Um, but, you know, after after some reframing, I can usually get back to a point where I'm just I'm just writing for myself, writing a book that I would like to read. Um, so if I, this is the kind of story that I, I stay up late because I can't stop writing, then hopefully the reader can't stop reading and they'll keep turning the page. Now, I know we um, talked a little bit about writing from many points of view. Um, I'm curious about what led you to have Dorothy be the, the generation that kind of addressed the generational trauma and did the work to heal instead of having like Annabelle be like what made Dorothy the one to to be the person to go through all of that you know I I needed um I needed to create a sort of a, a believable technology and so I, I'm basing it on on real science today but I've repurposed it in the future um and I just I really I needed a character to be you know in this slightly science fictional uh, setting. So 2045, you know, we don't have flying cars and we're not living on the moon. Traffic sucks worse than it does now. And the weather is a little more, uh, dynamic. Um, but I knew I was, I had always wanted to write historical and speculative at the same time. It's almost like, I almost think speculative fiction is my first language. I just backed into historical fiction and then kind of cornered myself there um so yeah just just needing this this technology this epigenesis uh therapeutic treatment um it had to be in the future and so that's what dorothy became and then she needed to be my protect like I, I was as i was writing i would i would have to count pages because i wanted to make sure dorothy had more pages than anyone else so that she still feels like um, the main character and that she has that kind of attention. Um, yeah, it's just kind of all the, the funny things you do to, to make it work. Yeah, I know there were a couple of times where I, because I was listening to it and I would have to put it on pause because <laughs> of Lewis and just be oh, like, oh, God, he's, <laughs> he's, he was awful. And then I say that in the best way possible. Um, he was a character that I just like, I just want to murder him. Uh -huh. um, and scream at her, get the hell away. But you kind of have to have him and mm -hmm. that. You and he's such a, you know, he represents, you know, most confounding people. Like when my my daughters were in, you know, high school and they're dating some boy for, you know, a week or a month or whatever. 
and then they would break up or it was so hard to break up. And it was because they weren't all bad or all good. They were like, you know, 54% a douchebag and then 40, 44%, you know, a nice, charming young man. Um, and so I wanted Lewis to kind of be like that. I mean, he's not pure evil or anything. He's just a poor fit um, for that relationship. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of a douchebag. <laughs> respect <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was re or thinking about all of the the missed opportunities that each of them had and I and I just thought I don't know which one what's more heartbreaking like um Zoe and Alice who never had the chance to be together even though they loved each other or you know uh, Greta and Sam who just Sam was just so frustrating and so disappointing because he started out so strong <laughs> <laughs> but I just think the all of the characters were so well developed to like elicit to have me like yelling at my phone or like putting the book down and walking away it's just like it's very powerful writing to like make you yell at the device that's reading the story to you. <laughs> I'm going to share my, my secret. Um, Cause people are, people are like, I really like how you write characters and stuff. Um, what I try to do is I never, I don't over describe my characters. Like I almost never talk about what they're wearing or what they look like, what they're, you know, I, 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 I really just, <laughs> the reader observes what they do, but not what they look like or what they sound like and stuff like that. And so by doing that, I try to, it's like completing a circuit. I try to draw part of a circle and then let the reader's imagination close the circle. And then that character becomes very real to them because they've put some of, you know, their imagination into that character. And I saw that with my first book, um, there's a character, Mrs. Beatty. She's a lunch lady. I never describe her ethnicity, but in the South, readers assume she's black. And in the Northern States, readers assume she's white. Um, hmm. They're both right, because people <laughs> are, are bringing their own imagination to the party and completing that character in their mind. It sounds a little- I like that <laughs> advice or that that, a uh, tip <laughs> or secret. Yeah, yeah I, I under describe them and then their actions jump out more. And that could, I think that could be something that is very easy for writers to do without realizing it is over describe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, to, to fall into that. So that's something to just kind of really be aware of and be conscious of and to go, oh, maybe. I need to pull back a little bit and leave some room for the reader here instead of detailing every single part of this scene, like give them some room to detail it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's just what I do. It's, it's not probably not for everybody. And, but I, I notice it when I'm, when I'm reading a book and I, you know, I, I open a chapter and there's like four sentences of description of what this character looks like. And I always feel like, Oh, that's, kind of helpful, but not, I don't think it's necessary sometimes. Hmm. No, and I like that because I mean, in some ways we, we have to remember to trust our audience and not talk down to our readers and trust that they can actually understand what we're writing and the points that we're trying to get across. Yeah, I just, I think, like like real people, um, mm-hmm. what people do is more important than what they look like. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it says a lot. People's actions or lack of of action, um, mm-hmm. and characters are kind of the same way. But sometimes there's just um, <laughs> there was another thing. Uh, did did you happen to read? There's a book called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. I'm gonna get way off into the weeds here i have not read that one i've read his food books oh yeah when i 
yeah, when I get when you when you said that, I was like, oh, he did something other than food books. I'm going to have to check this out. Yeah, it's about, um, you know, he went and tried every type of hallucinogen and wrote about it, you know, as a, mm -hmm. a man who's never tripped on drugs and he's in his 60s. Um, but he talks about how uh, studies have shown that what we observe, um, like if we're looking at a mountain range, we're only seeing maybe 60 or 70 percent of it. And the rest, our memory knows what a mountain range looks like, just kind of fills in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're not you're not seeing it completely. And I I think sometimes you can do that with writing like. You could just say police officer. You don't have to say, is it, a, you know, is it a Texas police officer with like the big Smokey the Bear hat, or is it a New York police officer with a little, you know, the cap? Um, what do they look like? Do they have silver buttons? Are they bronze buttons? What does the badge look like? It doesn't matter. People will project into that space what a police officer is to them, and so by under describing um, and then just letting their actions describe them, the you know, the aesthetic things about characters. Um, it saves you some work and mm -hmm. become very real to the reader because they, it's not short circuiting what they already have in mind, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Now, this is quite possibly like the silliest question, but yeah. I feel like it's very appropriate yeah. for what we're talking about and having your mind kind of supply details for you in your authors and uh, in your acknowledgments you were i loved the crayon metaphor that you were uh that you had written and the crayon names don't laugh at me it's a little i've been thinking about this question for a week <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not laughing one, at you i know exactly where you're going and i one, think i know what's... Uh, one of the the you're listing the crayon colors and you mentioned one of the crayon colors being grandmother's perfume. And immediately that that brought like, I just saw a color in my mind. And I was like, I wonder what other people see when you hear the color grandmother's perfume. What color do you see? So I was like, oh, I want to ask Jamie what color he sees. And he oh, thinks I want to know what grandmother's color you saw perfume. though first because I'm I had a color too. That's, but that's going to, you know, taint your, your color. Yeah. Write down your well, color so no one... one so no one's answer is influences yours. I never, I never, I thought it was wild that there was a crayon of that <laughs> color, but I never really thought what that color might be. Um, but as soon as you started talking about it, I, I saw it as like a, like a, a dusty uh, matte yellow or kind mm -hmm. of a, you know, a faded pastel blue or seafoam oh, green or see. something that's kind of that. That's mint. so cool. Um, what but, color did you see? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Diana, what color did you see? Um, a dusty pink, like one of a faded pink. Cause I thought about when you, when I think about grandma's perfume, I always think about flowers. Totally. That flowery kind of scent, which led me to that like faded pink. Yeah, that, that I, I get it. And I think they're all they're all valid in their own way, but it's, oh, yes. that it's it's more powerful when it's personal, I think. That's the, and I saw like a really, really pale purple. Nice. And okay. I think it's so cool that everyone sees something different. <laughs> so that kind of ties in a little bit to our it's conversation. Cool. So it's not a totally off topic question. Not at all. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I but I do want to get into the food, the food question. Yes, um, yes. Because we always, whenever there's food in a book, we always like to discuss it. Um, I love the the use of the food in the book because it wasn't like overpowering of this in the story, but I loved how it used um there was a cultural aspect to it, but also a class aspect to it, because with a fong, you have her she was being starved. And when they did feed her, it was like these small bowls of rice. And then when you get up to like uh, Greta and Dorothy, you have those uh, traditions. I forget what it was. There was like a dessert. I forget the what the dessert was that I, it kind of made me chuckle that one hated it, but yet the other one loved it. And the, 
generation. So I kind of want to talk about how you use the food to show those aspects of their stories. That's really interesting. I, I, I try to write for all five senses. I mean, it's really easy to, to think cinematically and just write like a screenwriter would, just write the visual. Um, but I like to have my characters hear things and touch things and smell things and taste things. And so food always, um, food is a great thing that it, can, it shows like a, a moment in time. You know, you can show a type of food that was popular in the 20s that we don't eat anymore. Um, and so it's it, it helps create those individual worlds. Um, but that's interesting. I, I I hadn't actually thought of that, but that totally works because Afong, you know, she's this star, but her handlers, her managers are living well off of her and eating quite well, and she's not. And then you have, you know, Greta, who is being courted um, by, two, you know, has encounters with two different people. Um, and food is such a huge part of that. Um, and, you know, lavishly so. So definitely, it does speak to class, for sure. I hadn't quite thought of it that way. But, but it, I think, um, instinctually, we probably do it a lot that way. Mm -hmm. That's a cool observation. I like that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I think our, our food question is probably one of our favorite questions to, to talk about. And that's become like Diana's <laughs> question. <laughs> it, it, I think it, of weird ones. Like, what color do you see when you think of this color? It, it also, I mean, I don't do it for this reason, but I, I can appreciate it. It gives book clubs uh, things to serve that are thematically, you know, connected to the book. I, I'm in a book club. I've been in a book club for more than 10 years. Um, I'm in a guy's book club, which isn't supposed to exist. It's like the Loch Ness Monster Sasquatch. It's, it's theoretical, <laughs> rumored to exist. Um, but uh, yeah, we read, you know, Confederacy of Dunces and the guy who was hosting it, he ordered alligator online and made fried alligator. Wow. Um, the, I hosted last month and we read Lincoln and the Bardo and I made, you know, Civil War era food, um, including hardtack, which is what the soldiers ate. It's just like, uh, you know, it's water and flour and salt and it, mm -hmm. it, you bake it and you cure it and then it can sit on the shelf for, you know, years, but it'll, it's like eating plywood. Um, yeah, by, by putting food in there, then book clubs can you know, find a few cool things to uh, to make, complete the experience. I think I, I remember having, or not having to make hard tech, but we could make hard tech for extra credit uh, mm -hmm. in a history class when I was in high school. And it was so gross. It's like it really was like eating just nothing, just okay. like hard substance and no and just salt <laughs> yeah soldiers would dip it in water to soften it and then eat it which doesn't make it sound better no <laughs> <laughs> i don't think no. there's any way to redeem it at all we uh this past weekend we uh we try to go to the sports service cabin every winter and you cross-country ski in and we bring all our stuff and sleds and backpacks and we stay in there's a cabin that has no electricity or running water there's uh, a wood stove and some uh like propane lights and stuff um but i brought the hard tack right? so, you know, I, left, <laughs> I left it in the cabin on the shelf uh, <laughs> see if it's there next year when we revisit the place <laughs> it'll be There's the emergency stash. To try to eat it. stash yeah survival <laughs> food Now, I know we're coming up on our hour and I'm trying to look at, we have like a whole list of questions that I'm trying to look at. We can do the lightning round. I, I know I'll try to <laughs> give some long-winded answers. I think oh, we're Diana, at Michelle's and questions. And Michelle's questions question. aren't so great on, on lightning round. No offense or anything, Michelle. No, no, mine are like essay questions. They, these are not multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I actually wrote the same question. I didn't even see that. I think. Huh. Um, oh no, that 
that was mine. But this could be a, a lightning round question is which okay. storyline was most challenging for you to write? Mm, um, uh, like King's storyline, which is set in the late 1800s. Um, and for a really weird reason, but because I have a, a ship in uh, my last book, um, it just felt weird. I'm like, I'm writing another vintage uh, ocean crossing experience kind of a thing. Um, and so for me, it was it was it was challenging to write it in a way that was different. Um, and and you know, it's a different era. It's a different class of ship and stuff like that. But for me, I was just like. I need this to be part of the story, but I also was like, ah, this, is, this is difficult to write because I've done it before. Um, and the easy one to write was Greta because it's contemporary and doesn't require the same amount of research. That was just a breeze. That's I, I get it. I I, I, I want to write contemporary books from now on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they flow so nicely. Yeah, I want to say nice to have like one storyline. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> to have one storyline where zero or minimal research was required. Yeah, that was where you can just write from memory. I mean, what I'm I'm working on something now that's set in the 70s. And there's I look up certain historical things just to kind of salt the season the story with uh you know stuff from that world. Um I always describe it as like whatever era I'm writing about, I want to find out who the Kardashians were, you know, who, who were the kind of Kardashians in 1835, <laughs> you know, who, mm -hmm. who were people gossiping about and, and, and watching and talking about that kind of stuff. Um, and so even if I'm writing about the seventies, I'll have to, you know, plug in um, whatever, you know, pop culture wise was going on, uh, but it's easier. So who were the Kardashians of the seventies? Of the seventies, um, <laughs> boy, they were. You know, I don't think there was a complete like analog. You know, you had Cher, who was outrageous. Um, the Gabor sisters. There was like Zsa Zsa and Ava, and there's another one which I don't remember. It's like Magda or something like that. That they were famous for being uh, famous. You know, famous for being you know beautiful women who married well. Um, and then rolled out, you know, that was their brand, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's off, off the top of my head. Um, well, I know <laughs> we will, have, we will definitely have to keep an eye out for your next book because this, we, we have loved this and thank you just so much for making time for us and coming to hang out and let us ask all these questions and um, everyone if you have listened and you have not read the book you can always uh, you know and really honestly didn't spoil anything really I mean we didn't, we didn't talk about how Afong dies in a flaming car wreck on page 284 um, no no that that, <laughs> no, that particular no, paragraph we, we skipped yeah. over that one so um, you know my spoil spoilers were kept at a minimum so you can definitely still order your own copy um off of our bookshop on bookshop.org the link of course is in our show notes and bookshop.org as always supports our wonderful writers it supports the podcast but most importantly it supports all the wonderful indie bookstores out there and jamie thank you again we have had an absolute blast hanging out with you my pleasure thanks for having me thank you enjoy the rest of your evening I am going to take care. <laughs> Bye.